Good morning. In today's webinar, we're going to discuss planning a seeding. We're going to go over the type of information you need to know to determine if seeding is necessary and then how to do it right. We'll focus on the process and provide anecdotal information specific to seeding in the West in hopes of helping you avoid pitfalls. And later we'll discuss how to determine which species characteristics are best suited to addressing the resource concerns, landowner objectives, and site conditions that you're dealing with. This webinar is one of six in a series that describes the entire seeding process. For optimum success, users should reference the other webinars as well as the noted references and other sources of information that we're providing. The webinar series is really designed to be used as a unit and important information in one webinar may be needed to fully understand the information in another. Over the course of today's training, we'll try to convey things we've learned and especially note problem areas, uh, such as things you have, may have never thought about um, without specific ex experience. And throughout the training, keep in mind that we're addressing the process from a vegetative perspective which is the plant's ability to establish and survive and provide an intended conservation and or production benefit. Related to conservation benefits, also keep in mind that there's a huge difference between a plant merely surviving versus a plant thriving. And our goal and expectation is that the plants thrive. Otherwise, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to provide the intended conservation benefit. So how important is planning? Well, in defense of this project, the folks building this home certainly considered that there is an existing pole that would need to be moved at some point. That said, um, there's also a homeowner in Bridger that has a large green ash tree growing right in the middle of his driveway close to his garage, much like this pole. He says he so appreciates trees that he couldn't stand the thought of cutting it down when he built his house and he's willing to drive around it. The take home messages are not only is planning important, but you better know your customers objectives as well. Before even thinking about developing a seed mix, we have um, first identify three things. The resource concerns, then determine the landowner's objectives and then identify the important site and environmental characteristics of the project site. Once you have a good handle on what the site can support um, and you can do that through a thorough site inventory, then you can revisit with the landowner to determine if their original objectives are still attainable or if a plan B is going to be needed. Once a practical objective has been agreed upon, um, then you can proceed to identify the needed plant and plant community attributes for the seeding project. Almost every conservation plan begins by identifying critical resource concerns. Uh, for a vegetative project, projects, here are a list of some common resource concerns that can be addressed using plants. Um, the specific resource category here is in the parentheses. Um, the plant material program has all kinds of technical information on, on how to use plants to solve problems. And we'll describe some of those today and where to find that information in just a little bit. I'm going to describe what I call levels of functionality of plant cover, which is my way of describing the type of plant community we're trying to establish. Sometimes just having a vegetative cover of any kind is sufficient, but in other cases, our goal may be to recreate or mimic some sort of functioning plant community, which is much more difficult and much more expensive. Revegetation can be described as the easiest type of seeding. Basically, we're trying to get something green to grow on a site that provides some essential function, um, like preventing erosion or cooling the soil surface or providing um, wildlife cover. 
Um, this is often adequate and timing critical situations like you might have a steep slope that you need to revegetate after a fire or revegetation is used when some of the funds are limited. The next st step of functionality is really reclamation, and that's defined as establishing a plant community that functions somewhat in a pre-disturbance fashion. So the goal of a reclamation project, such as a mine land project, um, would be common, although revegetation is also sometimes adequate in mine land reclamation. The most difficult level of functionality is restoration, where the goal is to recreate a plant community and emulate its roles in an ecosystem. Um, this is time consuming and it's expensive and it's often reserved for genetic preservation on high value sites, such as um, ecosystems that you might be planting in the National Park Service system. When working on private lands, the objective of the landowner must align with the prevailing resource concerns, site conditions, and program requirements. These goals are not necessarily mutually exclus exclusive, but they can be. As an example, a landowner is interested in cost sharing on a pollinator habitat enhancement project, but they would also like to have ample grass and a seed mix so that the site can be grazed after the life of the pollinator planting. Some grass is allowed in the mix, um, but if you have too much grass in the mix, it can inhibit forb establishment, which is the intended goal of a pollinator planting. So it's important to strike a balance, um, and that may be possible with modest amounts of uh, non-aggressive grass species in the pollinator mix, or by modifying the design of the mix. Landowners may also prioritize certain resource concerns uh, with both conservation and economic purposes in mind. Preventing soil erosion keeps the land productive and conserves the valuable resources, and using plants to compete with invasive species increases productivity, and it also reduces weed control costs. Another example might be that cover crops can enhance soil health um, result and result in greater productivity and potentially reduce operating costs on a site. You've probably heard about SMART project goals and objectives, ones that are specific, measurable, attainable, reasonable, and can be accomplished in an allotted time frame. When you're working with your landowner to set your objectives for your project, make sure they're specific. So you want them to be specific, yet practical and understandable. We want them to be measurable, allowing appropriate monitoring protocols to determine if we've been successful with our seeding project. They need to be attainable um, within the given site potential in climate. Uh, they also need to be reasonable, so consider any socioeconomic constraints because cost is a very real factor in all of our seedings. And then they need to be accomplished in a time frame that's reasonable. One of the first questions to be considered when looking at a site needing vegetation improvements is, what is a better approach, a new seeding or managing what already exists? Today we're focused on seeding, but seeding may not always be the right answer. It might be better to improve or change the site management and allow natural recovery. This is often the case when the desired species are present and they make up greater than 25% of the total vegetation on the site. Um, consider, for example, that uh, non-irrigated plantings are really prone to failure, and that can waste uh, investment resources and possibly degrade the site even more as a result of the planting preparation work. In the Intermountain West, approximately 50% of the 
of all the plantings fail for one reason or another. Yeah, especially areas receiving less than 10 inches of annual rainfall, they have the highest failure rates. And in the southwest deserts of the US, the failure rates can start to approach 80%. So seed and site preparation costs are high. Site preparation activities can further degrade the site, especially in areas that have been infested with noxious weeds like cheatgrass, um, so regardless of your decision, seeding or management, it's really important to invest adequate time determining which approach is going to be best. Other considerations before you get into seeding is determining um, the success with compatible seed mixes. So seeding in areas of low precipitation is also a consideration and sites that have heavy weed infestation are particularly risky. Um, also, interseeding within existing vegetation is seldom successful. A couple of take home messages. Um, understand the local site and climatic conditions and learn from past successes and failures to fine tune your seeding prescription and improve your outplanting success. Use your local sources of expertise and experiencing and experience in developing your seed mix. And that often includes the landowner and their experience working with the site and trying to revegetate the site or sites within their property. We can't over overemphasize the importance of a thorough site inventory. Again, it's really easy to get ahead of ourselves when planting a seeding, selecting the right plant species, deciding if the planting should consist of all natives or introduced species, or getting into what cultivars or selections should be specified. Uh, it will all be influenced by the site conditions and the planting goals. So it's really important to complete a good site inventory and to thoroughly document that your findings. In plant materials, we often get calls or emails to help develop a seeding or diagnose plant problems and are only sent a picture or a rudimentary site description. And our standard response to those requests are that we need to see samples of the site, soil samples, plant samples, or we need to make a site visit in order to put together a good seeding plan. We state the seemingly obvious when we say um, for seedings to be successful, the plant materials must be adapted to the site. But not surprisingly, uh, weak site inventories and inspections can lead to poor plant selection choices. And often missed is the distinction between site conditions now and site conditions at some previous reference point like when an ecological site description or a soil survey was conducted. In order to ensure proper species collection, selection, a site inventory should be conducted to identify the prevailing and important aspects of the site, including the climate, the landscape position, soils, vegetation, both the vegetation currently growing on the site and historically on the site, and what equipment is available for your seeding project. Once you've determined that simply managing the site won't work, then you need to begin planning for a seeding. And one of the first items on your list should be obtaining basic climate data and use the most localized information you can find. You'll want to know the length of the growing season so you can choose well-adapted species and know when you can install the seeding. You'll need to know the annual precipitation and its seasonal distribution. This is of course particularly important in dry land situations. In high rainfall areas, select species tolerant of wet conditions and conversely for low rainfall areas or areas without irrigation, use drought tolerant species. If only marginal irrigation is available, like one to two irrigations per season, then consider species with some drought tolerance. And try to find the most 
local weather data available. So perhaps through your NOAA sites or the NRCS soil survey um, or the snow survey website or elsewhere. All of these landscape position factors play a role in successful plants establishment, and it's important to know what species are inherently adapted to these conditions. Some plants like alpine bluegrass or alpine timothy grow well at high elevation sites. Some grow better on drier south facing slopes like ponderosa pine and fescue, and other species need extra moisture like our sedges, whereas some can tolerate fairly prolonged inundation like creeping foxtail and many stem wild rye. Matching your plant species to the landscape position where they're normally found will often increase your outplanting success. Soil characteristics are almost as important and limiting as the annual precipitation. We could easily spend an entire training session on soils and how they impact plant growth and their relevance to numerous aspects of the seeding, especially site preparation, planting, and mechanical cultivation. Seasonal conser or seasoned conservationists will know which species typically grow on which soil type and can even predict the relative impact of soil type over a range of soil conditions. For instance, some salt tolerant species like western wheatgrass will fade out as the soil salinity reaches a threshold, whereas other species like Nuttall's alkali grass may begin to emerge at that same salinity level. By knowing the salinity tolerance ranges of plants, planners can look at the site and predict the salinity levels of the soil based on what species are growing there. Soil depth also affects plant establishment and distribution by influencing water holding capacity, nutrient availability, and rooting depth. As an example, in the biological resources section of MLR8, we see that blue bunch wheatgrass is adapted to moderately deep to very deep soils, whereas a species like Sandberg bluegrass is dominant on shallow soils. We know that Sandberg bluegrass can grow on deeper soils as well, but it generally does not dominate those sites. Soil texture, which is the relative amount of sand, silt, and clay particles in the soil, has an enormous effect on plant establishment and growth. It affects important soil properties like the water holding capacity, the soil water availability, drainage, flow, nutrient retention, and availability. Uh, soil surface crusting and seedling emergence, soil workability, and more. As an example, in a recent study at the PMC, we found that soil texture plays a significant role in the average days to seedling emergence, with seedlings emerging faster when they were planted in a sand uh, with certain seeding depths than when planted in a clay loam soil. As an example, with yarrow, the sand treatments yielded nearly twice as many seedlings as the clay loam soil treatments, and they also were five days faster to emerge in the sand compared to the clay loam treatments. Plant species often favor um, establishment on soils characterized by certain texture. For example, the species on the left tend to be found on sandier soils, whereas the species on the right tend to be found more often on clayey soils, although there's going to be some overlap. Soil chemistry is also extremely important in plant establishment, and in the western U.S., pH, soil salinity, um, sometimes heavy metals, and of course general nutrition are really important factors. Some examples are that tall wheatgrass is best adapted to soils with a pH range of, range of 6.6 .6 to 10. Uh, Western wheatgrass and basin wild rye are adapted up to pH levels of 9. Um, in comparison, blue bunch wheatgrass is not well adapted to high pHs. 
So soil salinity can also be a major limiting factor, but species like creeping foxtail, tall wheatgrass, many stem wild rye, and western um, wheatgrass can all tolerate soil salinity relatively well. The general soil nutrition, which is typically the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, are also determining factors in plant distribution and establishment, and plants differ in their needs for nutrients. As an example, our native bunch grasses compete better in low nutrient environments, where annuals and weeds tend to compete better in high nutrient environments because they're fast growing and they can utilize available nutrients better than most native species can. So application of fertilizer is normally not done then in a rangeland planting or critical area planting. And it can actually be detrimental by encouraging weed growth on those sites. The nutrient and pH levels should be corrected as recommended by a standard soil test prior to seeding if you're working in an irrigated pasture or plantings where other biomass production is an objective. Remember that plant survival is directly linked to specific soil characteristics of the site. And the more you know about soils, the better decisions you can make about species selections. So get familiar with your local soil survey or even better, complement it by conducting a soil analysis of the site that you're working on. For more information on soils, you can use the web soil survey on the NRCS soil survey website or the soil data viewer and conservation desktop. If you have questions or need assistance, you can work with your GIS specialists or state soil specialists. Um, and in addition, you can find resources on soils included in the MLRAs and ecological site descriptions. When planning a seeding or planting, in addition to identifying the current vegetation on the site, we also want to gather information on the vegetation potential of a site. Um, for this, there are three useful sources of information. The first is the major land resource areas. Um, then the ecological site descriptions, which are located in FOTOG, and the soil descriptions and information found in the web soil survey. As a reminder, consider how recent management of the site may have changed what will grow there now. Um, so just because a species did well there in the past doesn't mean that it's going to grow well there now, um, at least not without maybe additional inputs on the site. The major land resource areas have distinct physiographic, geologic, climatic, um, hydrologic, soil, and biological resources. And as a result, the land use is often unique to each MLRA. Uh, we can use the MLRAs to get a general idea of the plant communities the area supports. For example, in MLRA 58B, which is the northern rolling high plains for Montana and Wyoming, it describes the area as supporting grassland vegetation. And then the MLRA description lists several grass species that can be found on the deep soils, grass species found on the shallow soils and ridges, and the grass species in the bottomlands and streams. And it indicates that big sagebrush brush is a dominant shrub species. An ecological site is described as a distinctive kind of land with specific characteristics that differ from other kinds of land and its ability to produce a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation. The ecological site description is a document that will contain information about the individual ecological site and species adapted to one ecological site may not be adapted to another ecological site. In the field office technical guide, the FOTOG, Section two has the ecological site description specific to your state. And the ecological site description will include information on the physiographic features, the climate, the soil characteristics, 
the historic climax and potential plant communities, the forage value, the wildlife value of those sites, and more. The plant community information is broken down into species composition and their normal percentages, and it can be a really useful resource for selecting species appropriate to the site, especially if you need a reference point for a significantly altered site that you're planning a seeding for. Of course, management objectives are a factor, and the native species listed in the ESD may not be for the best for purposes in mind given um, what the current site conditions are. As planners, you have a lot of inventory resources available to you, and this is a list of forms um, in Montana and Wyoming that you may have um, help you identify what is currently growing on the site and how it meets or does not meet the landowner's objectives. These resources can help identify the, what the species composition is, the percent composition or cover, and the density of vegetation on the site. Weed pressure is a huge factor with a new seeding. So prior to planting, we need to determine how weedy the planting site is and specifically what weeds are present or likely to emerge. Controlling weeds on the planting site prior to seeding is the single most important site preparation task you can do to increase your chances of seeding success. Do consider what weed treatment may mean in terms of the residual effect on subsequent crops and and seeding of different species. So control of weeds is often begins with the use of a broad spectrum um, weed control chemicals such as glyphosate, and it may be done once or tw one or two years prior to the actual seeding in order to be the most effective. Additional treatments with other chemicals might also be needed. So it's important to identify the weeds that are present and apply the right chemical or mix of chemicals for optimum control. Your university or extension weed control specialists are the best sources of help in this area. One excellent planning technique is also to use a bioassay, which is simply taking soil samples and spreading them out on a tray in a greenhouse and see what weeds will grow. By knowing the species and the life forms, whether they're grasses or forbs, um, are likely to grow, may help you fine tune um, the species list that you're going to be seeding and to help facilitate control of the weeds on the site. So if broadleafs are the dominant weed, perhaps sowing grasses will allow weed control with a broadleaf specific herbicide and then desirable broadleaf species can be seeded at a later date. Worth noting in your site inventory uh, is to know the type of equipment that's gonna be needed and its availability um, because its availability may limit the species option that you have and make seeding of a particular site difficult or impossible. Um, similarly, there might be site conditions that limit the type of equipment that will be effective. So consult with your state plant material support staff to explore options. Another consideration is whether the seeding can be installed with the available labor that you have available. Once you've conducted a thorough site inventory, it's time to check in with your landowner once again to verify that your findings support their objectives. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you need to make sure that all those aspects of the environment and the human world align properly so that you're going to be able to do a seeding uh, that meets the landowner's objectives. We want to provide you a list of good sources of information that you can use during your inventory planning stage of a seeding. All of these <clears throat> are available online. Um, you'll find our technical notes, plant guides, uh, final study reports, and other documents. 
So the technical notes have summarized information regarding all aspects of seeding and various climatic zones. They can be found in FOTOG section one. They're also referenced and linked in our standards and specs. And they're also available on the Montana and Wyoming plant materials webpage and our national plant materials webpage. Final study reports are similar to our technical notes, but they're much more in depth and detailed um, and describe the entire study process. Their findings may be summarized and um, digested in technical notes, or you can access the final study reports themselves on the National Plant Materials website. Our plant guides have individual species information about adaptation and distribution, um, establishment information, management, uh, tolerance to different soil types, forage quality, and more. And the plant guides are located in the USDA plants database. Finally, uh, in Montana and Wyoming, our perennial seed calculators are that are used for um, conservation practices 342, 512, and 550. Um, and are located in FOTOG section four, have additional, or they also include information on species precipitation range, species soil suitabilities, salinity tolerance, seeding rate, and more. In our overview webinar, the first in the series, we went over how to locate these different resources on the website. But if you're having trouble finding some of the information, just reach out to your plant materials program or discipline specialists. Once you've completed your site inventory portion of the process of planning a seeding and you know your landowner's objective, then you're ready to begin selecting appropriate plants for your seeding project. So now we're gonna talk generally about looking at species characteristics in the context of your objectives and resource concerns. We know not all species are equally good at doing all things, so we need to choose species that best address landowners objectives and the resource concerns. For example, grass is good for erosion control, tend to be fast growing, easy to establish, they have a good root system, they cover the ground well, and they're often rhizomatous or stoloniferous. That said, we sometimes need to make decisions to address a short-term emergency versus providing long-term plant community stability. For instance, if we're trying to control erosion on a steep slope directly after a fire, we might um, involve use species including cereal, grains or fast growing short lived perennials like slender wheatgrass for the emergency watershed protection. Whereas on a less critical site where we're trying to have more long term site stability, we might use a rhizomatous grass like western wheatgrass or thick spike wheatgrass. In contrast to erosion control, ideal plants for forage production have different characteristics. Forage species need to be palatable, um, have good biomass production, they need to have high protein and digestibility, and the plants need to tolerate heavy grazing and hopefully be disease and insect resistant as well. Appropriate plant species for wildlife habitat depends on the species of wildlife we're talking about. For birds, for instance, we're trying to optimize things like forage and food, thermal cover, structure for nesting, loafing and roosting, and cover for, from predators. Plants well suited for pollinator habitat enhancement provide the traits shown here, and they do it for both native insects and honeybees. As we know, we need flowering plants to provide these benefits across the entire growing season, but often misses the important role plants provide in pollinator nesting habitat, as well as for parasitoid insects that are beneficial to other pollinator insects and crops. 
So in non-irrigated environment, drought tolerant species are obviously needed. And in general, diverse native plant communities make for good pollinator habitat. Grass species good for weed control have some common traits such as um, they are easy to establish, they provide good ground cover, they're competitive, they're fast growing, and, and in general, a diverse plant community is better at keeping weeds out than a monoculture is. But as we've discussed, it's not always easy to get a diverse community established when a lot of weeds are present. With all of our site inventory information in hand, the task now becomes identifying the specific species uh, that will establish, persist, and meet the landowner goals within the resource constraints of the site. And that's gonna be the focus of our next webinar. Proper plant selection will consider all of the various factors we've discussed to date as shown in this slide. Until our next webinar, we want to leave you with the following resources. We hope you take time to look at these. Um, we also have this presentation on our website, um, and the links to these documents can be found either through our Montana and Wyoming SharePoints and also on the Montana and Wyoming Plant Material Program website. Thank you for listening to our webinar today, and if you have any additional questions, please reach out and contact your plant material program staff in your state. Thanks a lot.